Happy Thursday, Muskie fans. We're here on your RazorCast. That's Jeff Sink and Jim Reeker talking Muskie basketball as we do every Thursday. Big week in the past, big week coming up, so lots to talk about, as Jim always says. And, Jim, how are you doing out there today? I'm doing pretty good, Jeff. You know, we got a little, I don't know, what do you call this, an Indian spring? Uh, <laughs> nice weather coming up. They're talking about maybe 70 degrees one day next week, and we're still in February, but we know it's not going to last. But, hey, it raises the spirits right now, gets us through the uh, tough winter months. Of course, so does college basketball. Well, it is uh, it is nice weather to have, and in the middle of the, the college basketball, we know it. Cincinnati weather, we'll probably get a snowstorm sometime between now and opening day. We can't go too far on that one, but we'll, yeah. we'll take what we can get. Well, unfortunately not a great week for the Muskies. Uh, we'll, we'll take a, one game at a time here. We talked last week about the must win at Villanova in order to, or when Villanova came here, in order to get a chance to win the, the Big East. That didn't happen, and it didn't happen pretty big. We also had a big loss. But uh, talk to us about what uh, the positives might have been coming out of that Nova game. Well, of course, uh, you have to mention, I think, first the negative, and that, of course, the biggest negative. Besides the loss uh, was the injury to Trayvon Blewett, and he tried to play through it this again, but he just couldn't go. I give him credit because, you know, He's a warrior, and we talked about how he had fought through it for two or three games when he initially sprained it. Uh, that uh, he, he he went to Mac and he just said, I, "I'm I'm a liability out here. Get me out of here." Which you know you got to give him credit because sometimes you know guys try to play through it, but he realized he's hurting the team. But of course, then the team had to try to change their uh, focus on the fly without him. And the positives. Uh, Rasheed Gaston really stepped up. He scored 23 points and 10 rebounds, had a double-double. You know, we've been kind of looking for that from him, although the bigs have play, been playing a lot better. Uh, Quentin Gooden, I believe, only had two turnovers in that game. The Musketeers out-rebounded Villanova 42-26. to uh, Gates had seven rebounds. He's starting to contribute there. But, again, you're talking – it was the wrong game for something to go wrong because Villanova, you know, they're so tough. Again, that's why they're defending national champions. And they got the three-headed monster of Josh Hart, Jalen Brunson, and uh, Chris Jenkins. And you just can't shut all three of those down, especially when you lose somebody like Trayvon Blewett. Jalen Brunson's the one that kind of went off. When they get, got deep in the shot clock, he would take it to the bucket, and he's so good at that of – finding space or making space and uh, scoring. He had 17 points. And, of course, the Wildcats shot 90% from the free throw line. So it wasn't, it wasn't going to be for the Musketeers. You know, Coach Max said after the game, he said, I was proud of them because they continued to play hard and tried to make plays and stay in the game. And I think in the second half, and this was after Blewett had sat down, they, they got it down to about six points at one point, started to get the uh, Centos Center crowd into it. But, again, Nova's just so good at, making baskets and keep pushing you. And so we had to take the loss on the chin there. And, of course, that probably dashes any hopes of a Big East regular season championship for the 16-17 season. Well, not just for the, the, the Muskies, but for everybody. You know, they pretty much locked that up. They've got a three-game lead. They only have four to play. They do have to play Creighton and Butler, but Creighton lost last night to a tough seat Hall team, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So Nova can, can look at it, you know, whether they want to ease up on things and, and go into the tournament and decide how to do that, or step on the pedal and just push hard into uh, the tournament. Right now they're number two in the country, and uh, they've only got two losses, uh, so they're probably in line for a number one seed. But I, I, I hear you, and I love how you spin the, the, the glass uh, being half full, but unfortunately we can't make it look three quarters full of the, the things that we've talked about um, all year sort of bit the, the, the muskies in there. They, they only shot 35% from the field, and that's been tough. And even though, you know, Quentin Gooden did a good job at the point position, his shooting was, was terrible. He's only one for 14, so he's got to find his, his rhythm there. And, again, the free throws, barely over 50%. They did rebound well, well out-rebounded the, the 
the Nova team, but that uh, could have something to do with them shooting 52% from the field. Uh, <laughs> yeah, when you, know, you when you don't miss, you don't get a lot of easy offensive rebounds. Yeah, so um, so who knows? I mean, there's not there's not a lot of teams that can beat Villanova, and and we'll talk in a, a week or two when they both on our Trogcast and our Razorcast about their ability to repeat. It's a little too early to be speculating on that with uh, four games left in the regular season in the tournament. But uh, we've got to turn it back to the the Muskies because this is a, a, a crucial, crucial time for them. They're sitting at 18 and 8 right now. Like I said, they, they lost Trevon, so they've lost their, their best scorer. They lost Edmund Sumner. Uh, you know, Miles Davis never really kicked in, and one of their weaknesses all year has been that outside. So before we go into the, the Providence game, which of course blew up on them because Trevon didn't play, what have you heard about uh, Trevon's availability? And, and, and we both know, Jim, uh, an ankle sprain is tough. You, you, you can feel like you can come back on it, and then you're gone. Like you say, Trevon took himself out of the game as a liability. But sometimes those things just need rest, and there's no spots for rest in the next uh, uh, four to six weeks. Well, that's true. And uh, the, the reports right now coming out of the Xavier camp is he's day-to-day. And uh, basically, Chris Mack said when Trayvon feels that he can contribute and we feel he is contributing, he'll be right back in there uh, again. But, you know, it's it's one of those things. You don't want to put him out there and then, you know, just, you know, he goes down for two more games. So I think they're going to make sure that he's, he's not – he's probably not going to be 100% until after the season's over when he can really get some good rest. But, uh, you know, Trayvon at 80% would probably – help this team and contribute to it because, of course, he is their uh, leading scorer. Another point I want to make is we're talking about Villanova uh, and just the overall standings. You talked about Nova has really a three-game lead in the loss column over Butler, Creighton, and Xavier. And basically, the way I look at it now, if you're going to readjust your expectations and your goals, is they need to uh, finish ahead of Butler and Creighton. Second place is not out of the – out of the realm for this team, especially because we, we're going to become Nova fans because both of our opponents still have to play them. So we kind of hope Nova puts another loss on each one of them. And, uh, of course, we've already taken our two losses from them, and uh, we're, again, tied with five losses in the loss column. So you got to look ahead, and I think that's what Chris Mack does. And, you know, you, you can't sit and cry in your beer, so to speak, and worry about things now. You know, we'll have time to rehash what went wrong and all the bad luck we had come April. But right now we got to keep chugging forward and trying to figure this out and make do with uh, the players we have on the floor. Well, a good point there. In a second, the second is going to be tough, and I think last night's game showed that losing. Let's move on into that, that Providence game that we lost. It's on the road, and we go through a stretch here on the road against teams that are, are scrapping for tournament time. And without Trevon Blewett, uh, the, 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 the Muskies, you know, they, they mustered some things there in the first half. They did go into halftime up two, but basically got blowed out in, in, in the second half. And with Seton Hall and Marquette coming up, I hear you about trying to, to shoot for second, but you just hope that we're still in that position by the time we get to that Butler game late next week. Uh, but let's talk about uh, Providence first. The Friars pretty much put a whammy on the – the the muskies last night and, and with some of the same issues that I just talked about uh, coming to fruition. Yeah, um, you know, again, I give Chris Mack a lot of credit because he obviously had a good game plan going in there, using the guys he knew he wouldn't have blew it. Uh, they went inside and they kind of exploited uh, the Friars inside, and that's one of the strengths they have right now. You know, between Jones, O'Mara and especially Rasheed Gaston. Rasheed Gaston is a senior in February, and he's got that look in his eyes. I didn't come to Xavier to not play in the tournament. I came to Xavier because I wanted to be in the NCAA tournament, and I wanted to win some games in the NCAA tournament. So you see him emotionally out there. He's actually become almost the leader on the floor and because, you know, he is older. He has a lot of experience. So that's a positive, in fact, uh, what he put up last night, uh, 19 points and 10, another du- double-double for him. So that's the positive. Again, they out-rebounded him. But, yeah, here's, here's the two, and we've talked about it time and time again. 
Uh, the turnovers, 17 turnovers. We got to keep that around 10. And yeah, that free throw percentage last night, they shot 47%. And those are just two things that uh, they get better every once in a while, but we, we consistently, they don't get better. The other thing, if you watch the game in the second half, um, Kyron Cartwright just went off. I mean, and I think at one point they hit like nine, ten shots in a row when they really uh, edged that lead way out there. So, you know, it, it it's a loss, and they got to move on. They can't sit and worry about it because uh, Marquette is uh, sitting right around the corner. And, you, yeah, this stretch is very important because Providence, Seton Hall, and Marquette, uh, the three that we're going to play here in a row, starting with Providence last night, those three are sitting just, I think, outside on the bubble. And if they could put a good stretch together, and especially if they can get a win over Xavier, you know, Xavier's still got, a, even this morning, has an RPI of 15. Uh, that's a good win, and that helps their RPI improve and might be the difference between them getting in and not getting in. So they're almost like a marked target right now because they're kind of like the wounded duck who has a lot of points or a lot of, uh, give them a lot of uh, help in the NCAA selection process. Yeah, you're right there. And, and, and I watched uh, part of the, the second half last night, and uh, the smart thing on the Providence side is they were, were able to shift their defense to take Gaston a little more out of the game in the, the second half, which I think was uh, the key, and then the transition making those points. And, again, they were just the, the weaknesses out. So, you know, it could be a good thing that, that Blue is sitting now because that would give Quentin good in the time to, to run the team and figure out how to score. And then Trevon can come back and they can make a, a nice chin. But it, it, it's a tough, tough loss. Providence, uh, you know, hasn't been uh, doing uh, spectacular. They're at 16 and 11. So they're really the one on the bubble. Uh, the the yeah. other two, though, know, uh, last week, Joe Lenardi, who does his bracketology every week, doesn't wait until there's some uh, special uh, championship show on ESPN, and he does the whole bracket. He's got both Seton Hall and Marquette in those playing games, so, you know, the last four games that, that expanded to 68. So these wins could be very important for them, and of course very important for Xavier's uh, ranking. I mean, he had them down to a a number seven seed this past week, and with these losses, um, and you got to watch out. We'll talk about Marquette first. I know you're going up to visit your son and, and see that. But Seton Hall pulled off a big game last night in beating Creighton. That gets them another top 20 win. So Seton Hall next week will be tough. But let's talk about these Golden Warriors first. Well, again, yeah, they're in the same position. Their overall record is. Uh... Uh, I think they're 15 and 10, but they're sitting at six and seven. And actually, those three teams we're just talking about, I think, are all on six or seven losses. So they're sitting a couple games behind the three that we're in with. Uh, one other point about Providence, though, yeah, they've not had the greatest season, but their last game they beat Butler also. So they've beaten Butler and Xavier, the number 13 and 15 RPI uh, teams in the country, their last two games. So that's going to improve them. Uh, they've got their RPI up this morning to 62. But, yeah, to Marquette, um, again, and here, here's one other point before I get into Marquette is here's the problem. Chris Mack comes up with a great game plan to use what he has like he did last night, and it worked for the first half. But the problem is there's such great coaches in the Big East that they adjust to it. And Ed Cooley, as you pointed out, made a, did a good job of changing things up and taking advantage of the weaknesses that the Musketeers had. Because I would guess he didn't know whether Blewett was going to play until, you know, right before the game when he saw that he wasn't uh, dressed. Because, you know, they kind of keep a, a lid on that. So they have to prepare for him. And it takes away from preparing things if he's not there. But anyway, on to Marquette. Yeah, yeah. Um, Again, I think we can dominate the inside. Marquette does have a big boy, Luke Fisher. He's 6'11", but uh, he's 6'11", and he's, you know, I've kind of followed Marquette because of my son a little bit through the years. He's never developed really to what they thought he would be. They thought he would be a dominant big man, and he isn't. Uh, I think Gaston and Jones and even Amara uh, can still control the inside against him. 
The big problem with the uh, Golden Eagles, as they call them now, but if you go up there, they don't call them the Golden Eagles. The real Marquette fans, they still call them the Warriors, is they're one of the best three-point shooting teams in the country. In fact, they are the best three-point shooting team in the Big East, shooting at 41%. And it's basically three guys, a, a freshman who's been a superstar, can be a superstar, Marcus Howard, shooting 50%. From three, Kate and Reinhardt, the uh, transfer who came from USC, shooting 37%. And Andrew Rousey, he's a uh, transfer who came from uh, North Carolina at Asheville. He's shooting 46%. But here's the thing with those three. They're all three only averaging about 10 to 12 points a game. But what happens every once in a while one of them goes off and gets the mid-20 to close to 30 points or a couple of them. So that's what you got to do. You got you cannot let them get going with their three-point game. And, of course, uh, you know, I think they, the Musketeers will focus on that. Stop the three-point game. I think they believe uh, the big boys can handle Fisher and keep him to his 10 or 12 points that he averages a game. So defense is going to be the key. But, of course, they're going to have to score. But I think, again, I think they can – exploit the uh, Warriors, Golden Eagles, whatever you want to call them, on the inside a little bit with their, their big their big men. All, good points all. And, and as, uh, you know, Coach Wojo coming from the, the Duke tradition, they, they shoot the free throws well. They're up around 78% there. Uh, their overall field goal percentage is, you know, 48, 49% and, and the whopping, you know, three-point percentage of, of almost uh, 42%. The other thing they've got, and you mentioned some of those guys, that they have six guys that average, uh, you know, 10 or more points. And that means spreading it around and, like I say, one going off, the other going off. And then they go, you know, nine or ten deep. I mean, they got guys going in there for 10, 11 minutes down to their nine spot, and that makes for a fresh team coming out. The one thing working against them right now, since those two great upsets they had earlier this month where they knocked down Creighton, when they were number seven, and then followed that up with their big upset of, of Villanova. Again, one of only two teams to have beaten Villanova so far this year. They're only uh, one and five, or one and four, and that one uh, win being against DePaul, although it was away. I mean, they've lost to four straight uh, Big East opponents. So that might work in Xavier's favor. They might have peaked a little too soon or been off the radar, and now people were looking at them after those back-to-back upsets, uh, which also followed a tough game against uh, Butler on the road. So we'll have to see. I know you're going to be up there, and it's going to be a fantastic atmosphere. Um, so we'll National Marquette Day. It's, it's Marquette Day. So that's, like you said, that's like their homecoming um, so it'll be it'll be a rowdy, rowdy thing like Cintas at its loudest. So it's never an easy place to play. And again, they are the ones scrapping for a position. Um, any other thoughts on Marquette before we move on to to Seton Hall, who again got that nice. Well, you kind of you kind of touched on it, the atmosphere. And again, uh, it's a seven o'clock tip up there. I can tell you, I'm going to a Marquette party that starts at one o'clock. Um, and I'm sure there'll be several going on in the city. We know Milwaukee likes to have fun, and there's plenty of places in Milwaukee to enjoy yourself. So I'm sure the crowd will be very rowdy. The good thing is I've been there for a few Xavier games through the years, and usually there is a contingent of uh, Xavier fans that make the trip up there, especially being on a Saturday. Hopefully they could find tickets uh, because, again, I'm sure it'll be sold out uh, my son has – there's people coming in from California, Cleveland, uh, to his house, friends. Again, this is just a, a big – it's a holiday in, in uh, Milwaukee. But I'll be there trying to set them up. I'll be yelling for the muskies as loud as I can. <laughs> That's good. Set them straight up there, especially that young buck of a son of yours and, and telling you he's raised a, a muskie fan. I don't care where he went to college. Uh, of course, moving on to the Seton Hall Pirates – you know, they've got, uh, you know, they're coming in strong again. They, they upset Creighton uh, last night, which but it was at home. Creighton now to dropping number 20, and that's one of the problems with the Big East, which might hurt these guys, is some of the teams they thought were really going to be powers are slipping. Xavier's out of the top 25. Creighton's 
uh, down to, to number 20. Butler's in the was 22, 23, depending upon who you're looking at. Uh, but also these Pirates have to play Villanova. Of course, they, they get them at home on Saturday and then follow up uh, the next next week with, with the Muskie. Um, what are we looking at in terms of the danger against the, the Pirates? Well, the Pirates are led by the big three, uh, Angel Delgado, who, of course, I think leads the country with th- 13 rebounds a game, and he, I don't know, he's had like 20 double-doubles this year. And he is the one player in the league that maybe can at least uh, offset the inside power that the Musketeers do have going right now. But they have Desi Rodriguez and Kadeem Carrington uh, averaging 15 and 17 points respectively. So, But the, the good thing is we just played them uh, a couple games ago, so the turnaround won't be, you know, it'll be fresh in their mind. And actually – if you recall in Seton Hall, of course, we only won by two points. We kind of kept Delgado, Rodriguez, and Car- Carrington under control. But then Miles Powers went off. He only averages 10 points a game. But against Xavier the last time, because we were focusing on the other three, he scored 26 points. So that's, uh, you know, if uh, Blewett's not back by that game, you know, it makes it kind of thin. You know, really the Musketeers are playing seven and you know, sometimes O'Mara doesn't even play a whole lot. We're, we're talking about a, a six-man rotation. Actually, three of the seven are really big men that sometimes play only that one position, although uh, Coach Mack has put in some uh, plays where, or some offense where he uses two big men at the same time. So, yeah, and it's, not, it's on the road, so it, it's not going to be easy. Uh, uh, the way I looked at uh, they, these three games, and, of course, they lost to Providence last night, I I thought they could win two. I, I thought I thought they almost had to win one, but uh, we can talk about that. The overall picture, uh, you know, again the RPI, which uh, NCAA still uses as their main uh, guiding point this year. Actually, I read somewhere where they're going to change that next year, probably. Uh, is that the Musketeers are still sitting at 15, and uh, they put a lot of, into that. So the Musketeers, you know, they just can't fall flat on their face and. And just, you know, well, we got five games left. If, if they lost all five of these games, especially if they lost to DePaul, who's the only one even out of the top 100 as far as RPI is concerned, that would be a devastating loss. Of course, that's the last game of the season up there in Chicago. That's, uh, that's going to be an important game. So, uh, you know, it's going to be same old, same old against the uh, Pirates. They, uh, they got some uh, characters that we have to deal with. Well, you bring up a couple of them. One is, I mean, they put it to Creighton the way uh, teams have been putting it to to the the Muskies. They shot 51% from the field last night. They shot 40% from three point. They shot 72% from the line. Um, you know, out, you know, almost uh, crushed it on the, the boards, 25 to 42. The Seton all had the advantage. So if they come with a game like that, and, and Xavier plays. Uh, the type of game they've been playing, it, it could be difficult. And I, I, I agree with you with the RPI. The, the problem now is, uh, we'll talk about it in a minute, but we, you brought up a point that uh, a lot of people need to to understand. We did just play them a little while ago. We played them at home and just barely beat them. What happens in that quick turnaround when you know a team that well and you've got to play them uh, that soon? Is it an advantage to the team that lost or the, the team that that won. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't. Have, I don't know the answer to that. It's, a lot of it comes down to coaching. One other point I did want to make. I just again, I'm sorry. I, I think Chris Mack does an excellent job because last night in his press conference, he made the comment, "I'm not going to call any of these players out." He said, uh, "They're all doing what I'm asking them." He said, "I got to do a better job." In fact, he had a comment. He says. I've been telling them what to do. He says, I need to start teaching them what I want them to do. It's my fault. So many times in basketball, and I'm going to call a couple coaches out here, John Calipari, um, Bob Huggins, Mick Cronin used to. I think he's improved on this. I just hate it when a coach just sits there after a loss and lambast his players for not doing this or not doing that. Um, I just thought it was a classy comment by, you know, they've had a lot of adversity, and you get frustrated as a coach, and it's easy to point fingers at your players and say, 
I've told them what they need to do, and they're not doing it. And I, I just thought that was an excellent comment. Just and and gave, I think it gave uh, his players a, a boost that you know they they realize that he's with them and he knows they're trying as hard as they can. But uh, you know when you lose your two leading scorers within about two weeks of each other, that's a lot of adversity to overcome real quick. Yeah, it is a class act on, on his part, and, and you got a good point about the, uh, the different rankings that they use. They are uh, number 15 in the RPI, and their strength of schedule is, is very strong. They're 15. Uh, BPI, they're at 28. It's not a question of whether or not Xavier is going to go to the tournament, unless, like you say, they do lose the last five and go out in the first round of the Big East tournament. Then they might be looking at something different. But the other side of it is, is the rankings. Um, you know, it, it's just tough. You're, you're better off getting that higher ranking, and now they're not necessarily going to do it. And uh, that may work for or against other teams in the Big East if they, they rack up these wins. It, it is kind of sad. Villanova looking very strong. But some of these other teams in the, the Big East just haven't quite performed uh, overall the way I think people thought they would at the beginning of the year with Xavier might be at the the top of that list. So these wins that I'm talking about for teams like Seton Hall and Marquette, they may not mean as much to the committee if uh, those teams take more of a tumble as the season goes on. Yeah, I think you're you're exactly right. I think uh, just to uh, kind of tie this discussion up, uh, five games left. I think if they win three of those five, and of course uh, they got two of them at home, Marquette and Butler each at home once, uh, three out of the five, that'll give them 21 wins. Uh, if they could get a second seed in the Big East tournament, get a winnable game that first round, I think 22 wins after the Big East tournament, I think that pretty much locks them in. All right, then. Well, then let's uh, go ahead. We'll see how things happen. We'll be talking about it this time next week. And, uh, of course, join us on Tuesday for our Trogcast, where uh, this coming week we will be talking about our – our candidates are coach of the year, player of the year, and talk about some coaches on the hot seat in those those big conferences. But uh, we'll finish it off as we always do with our, our trivia and tidbits. So what have you got for me today, Jim? All right, as always, or I've kind of gotten into this. This is kind of a tiered thing. Easy questions first, leading to the big, tough question at the end. Uh, I was talking a lot about the Big East today. First question. I'll give you a couple minute, seconds on this one. It should be easy to figure out. The Big East. Eight of the ten Big East teams have been to the Final Four at one point of their basketball history. Can you name the two schools in the Big East currently who have not made a Final Four? Well, sadly, one of them is our team, and that's the, the Xavier Musketeers. Um, you are correct. Ah, uh, the other one, looking at it, it's the teams, you know, Villanova recently won it, Butler's been there, um, trying to look through this list, uh, it's down to a couple, but I'll say Creighton. You are correct, so ding, ding, you get back, you get at least a C today, okay? Uh, so that was them or Seton Hall, but I, did. I just had a hunch it was Creighton. Go ahead. You know, they made a very uh, nice run a few years back. Okay, next question a little bit tougher but not too tough name the three teams currently in the big east who have won national championships well so villanova obviously is the easy one uh you go back to marquette and uh with the, the great al the man of the the uh big time players and all that and then the third one would be georgetown you are correct Okay, it's going to get a little tougher here now. You ready? I'm ready. This is for at least a B. Six times, six times current Big East teams have been national runner-up. Can you name the six schools that have finished second in the national tournament that are current Big East members? Uh, the easy ones are Butler from a few years ago, and of course Georgetown, who um, was the second to, to 
to Villanova the other time that they won it. I believe uh, one of them would be DePaul because they went to uh, a Final Four there with, with Ray Meyer. That's what, three we got there? Uh, well, I'll bet you De- DePaul's wrong. DePaul's wrong, okay. So I can only get... Uh, uh, <laughs> five of the six. Five of the six. Then I'll just very quickly go through and say... Um, I know St. John's went to a Final Four. I don't know if they made the final game. Um, and Marquette probably finished second somewhere along the line there with the great Al McGuire. So. You are correct on the rest of them. Just a quick rundown. You did talk about Georgetown. Actually, Georgetown, and one of them I think was back in the 50s, has been a runner-up three times. Of course, they won the national championship. Butler twice, you talked about that. Seton Hall was a runner-up to Michigan in 1989. Oh, yeah. uh, Mar- Marquette was a runner-up to North Carolina State with the great David Thompson in 1974 before, of course, they returned in 77 to win it under Al McGuire. And a couple that I didn't even realize, in 1971, uh, UCLA beat Villanova in the final game. And in 1952, St. John's, you were probably thinking about the Chris Mullen team, it went in the uh, mid-'80s, but actually in 1952, and I'm not even sure who won it that year, St. John's was a runner-up. So, yeah, DePaul, yeah, they made the uh, Final Four in 1979. I remember that because at that time I was living close to the Notre Dame campus. I was a big Notre Dame fan, and Notre Dame also made it. That was their only Final Four appearance. So pretty good, five out of six. But here's the tough one. Oh, there's the pro- more. The province. Oh, yeah, this is the, the heart. If you get this one right, it's an A-. minus. If you miss it, it's a B plus. okay? <laughs> Providence you... Friars. Pro- Providence Friars, not Flyers, that's Dayton, who we played last night, made one Final Four. That was in 1973. Can you tell me who was their legendary coach in 1973 that took him to the Final Four. Oh, I should know this. You picture him, the name is not coming to me. I'll uh, give you a hint. I'll give you a hint. No, he, he, didn't has, save me. he has a big impact on the Big East. He is the Big East. So oh, uh, that's what I mean. I can picture him, but the name's not coming to me. Gavin, God, what's, the guy, what's his name? Dave uh, Gavitt. Gavitt. Yes, that's Dave, Dave Gavitt, who founded the Big East, and uh, he was the coach in 1973. Pretty good, pretty good. I know where you were. You're like, yeah, 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 I know who you're talking about. I just can't think of his name. So, once again, uh, Jeffrey, you have uh, done good. I'll give you an A- minus today. You, well, that's it. Right. It's nice to know that on all these SAT questions, I just might get into college. I just might not get into the Ivy League. That's all. Yeah, you know, gr- great effort. I'll give you a little little extra credit for effort today. So, all right, we'll go to this couple of other nice little tidbits to finish us off. It was on this date in 1923 that Howard Carter, the great anthropologist, unsealed King Tut's tomb, and the curse that went with it, and the, the many archives that came out of that. 1984 in Sarajevo, Bill Johnson becomes the first American United States, and I guess I should say, to win a gold medal in the U.S. Olympic downhill in the Winter Games. And this one's for you, Reek. In 1997, 20 years ago, Jeff Gordon becomes the youngest winner of the Daytona, the Daytona 500. 500. I, yeah. I watched that race. So, All right. Well, um, maybe next week on uh, our RazorCast, I'll have to do a little story time of recount maybe some of my uh, uh, charades in Milwaukee this weekend. <laughs> we'll see what comes up. I'm sure there's lots of things that we can do. We'll try to find a few other things that we can talk about. Join us on our Trogcast on Tuesdays where we talk about all things NCAA men's basketball, and we'll see you next week on our RazorCast talking about Xavier basketball. Go Muskies!